Reed, Bay of Quinty Conference. I have served three times on the business committee of general counsel, and I can't tell you how we will transform our business practices, but I speak in favor of this motion because it invites us into a mindfulness as we do our work. I am white, I am male, I'm six foot and a bit, I'm 200 pounds and a bit, and I have privilege. And I need to be reminded I have privilege. I am very much overjoyed that we have agreed to having an equity monitor because I have learned so much from our equity monitor working in our presbytery and in our conference. And I think that if this is one of those things where an equity monitor will help us greatly in our transformation, reminding us when we move too fast because we know the way. I support this proposal because it brings us into that time of mindfulness. And we need that. Yo. Heat mass. Heat mass, Jim. Nelson. Umax. Umax, Doreen. Umax, Jordan. Nora. Good cloud. Carmen Lansdowne. I'm a corresponding member from the facilitation team. And I've asked my friend and brother Michael to stand with me because despite the fact that I have had a lot of privilege to have my voice heard in this space. It was to do a task and not to share who I am, and that is terrifying. And with Russell, I, this is your work as the dominant church to do. I have grown up in a church where my mother sat next to Alberta Billy and with an F word attached, said they owe us an apology, and then Alberta Billy said, you owe us an apology without the F word. <laughs> with a mother who was fierce and passionate and carried her grandfather's spirit, which brought us into the Methodist church because our culture didn't previously have a concept of forgiveness, and they saw a way out of our traditional wars with the Haida and the Coast Salish and whose heart was broken during the Great War when Canadians were conscripted and volunteered to go fight evil in Europe. And he said, why are you white people so crazy? You have the answer in your book. That's why we took your book. My people were Christian before residential schools. And in part because the missionaries had the medicine to save us from the smallpox epi epidemic that wiped out over 98% of our people. And I have white skin privilege, in part because my dad is an English settler, and in part because Heistrecht don't really have to have super dark skin because we live in a temperate rainforest. And I am so, I feel invisible, and I know I am not. I have economic privilege, I have white skin privilege, I am educated, I have my PhD and two master's degrees, but because of that, because I fit in with the dominant church, all of this other part of who I am gets erased. And I'm asked to serve on facilitation teams or represent us at the WCC because I can speak well. Parce que je peux parler en français. Porque yo, yo puedo hablar en español. Porque mi esposo es, de, es guatemalteco. I can't speak hestrocuala other than to honor chiefs and high women and people when I start and to say when I finish. And despite all of this educational and economic and white skin privilege that I have, 
on my internship, someone in my book club said to me, when we were discussing the issue of what white skin privilege was and, and how people from marginalized communities can pass for white, somebody said to me, until you show up to church in a buckskin dress with a feather in your hair, you'll always be a little white girl to me. I was in candidate supply, I was the minister in that congregation, and my people don't wear buckskin dresses, by the way. I have had so many people in this church that I love come to me and say, you're so amazing, if they find out that I'm Hester, you're so amazing that you've been able to sort of lift yourself up out of, you know, that you don't have to, to have this experience of native life in Canada, and I'll share it here, I preached it at BC Conference last year. I am a victim of childhood sexual assault. I am an intergenerational survivor of residential school. My grandparent, my biological grandparents went to residential school. I am a recovering alcoholic. My older brother committed suicide. My mother's a 60s scoop survivor whose United Church minister and minister's wife parents refused their entire relationship with her to read the Indian Act when that was the only thing she ever asked them to do to understand why she was upset about institutionalized racism in the church. Our stories are not visible because you don't ask for them. You ask us to come here and to participate with you in what already is. And, and it is your work, it is your work as the dominant church to change, to understand that somebody like Colin could have something prophetic and beautiful to say to the church and that there's the possibility his being moderator wouldn't only just be about ableism and disability. And how I know that was the reason he didn't make it to the second ballot is because all week people would come and say to him, beautiful job with what you said. I love the words that Jared read. But nobody sat down and learned how to have a conversation with him or asked him about that. We have so much work to do and we passed all of the social justice proposals today with no discussion as if, oh, well, of course that's who we are. It is not who we are because we have people in this room who are hurting and broken because of how we are treating each other in this room. It's not out there. And I, I don't, I mean, I don't give two wits about a new proposal. I don't want to force anybody to ask for an apology, and I don't know what forgiveness looks like. I know that there are people in this room that I trust. I know there are people in this room who can lead you in looking at issues of economic and white privilege, like Jennifer, like Steve Heinrichs in the Mennonite Church. When you're wanting to look at the TRC, you're looking to the indigenous church for answers. Look to people who are already doing reconciliation from a perspective of dismantling their own white privilege. Those are your leaders. And we will walk with you and we will help you find them because we know who they are because they are safe. Anyway, I don't want to take up more time. I feel like I, all I did today is talk, but... I love this church and I am here because I love this church because this church has been my home. This church has saved me. I came back to church when I was six days sober 18 years ago. And when my whole body relaxed that first day on the first Sunday of Advent in 2000 and my, oh, I can be a minister now. My minister at the time did not tell me I was crazy as a six day sober, somebody who hadn't been to church in a decade, she said, maybe you've been avoiding that call. Let's have a conversation about that. So I am here and I am with you, but I am grateful for this conversation. I am grateful to you, Penny, for raising this because we sit here and we hurt and it's almost so, 
like my sister said, it, it's like this wall that is just around you and you can't, like, you don't see it and you just learn to accept it. And it's like, I'm not, we don't, yeah, I don't know what to do, but, well, let's go ask her. Thank you, Madam, Madam Moderator, and thank you to the court. I find it extremely difficult to be a victim. I found it very difficult to understand what it is to be marginalized. Because I grew up and worked for 20 years before coming to this country in a place where my color was the dominant and not just dominant but persons who were in charge. So I don't know if you understand that when I come into a space I don't understand what it is to not be recognized as a person. So I never owned it when I first came to Canada. But I came and I went to Northwestern Alberta. And there are not so many of us in Northwestern Alberta. And you heard reference made to, by the intercultural observer, to the minister who was um, told, we don't want, we've, we're not comfortable with hiring a minister, but then right after hired a female minister, but right after hired a white female minister. I was the minister who was told that. And that was my first introduction to, maybe you're not so hot after all, you need to come down a peg or two. And then I moved from that province, I moved to another conference totally, and had a completely different encounter with racism, which I won't go into here. But that also took me down another three or four pegs because I don't remember my friend's name, the first person who spoke who said he was 200 pounds, male, white, all the rest of it. That became a reality for me because I'm female, I'm not exactly young, I'm black, and all of that in the face of what I encountered made it very real. I was not in my own space and I was not counted as a person. And you know what? It was interesting to find where the support came from. How many of my white colleagues emailed, called, made a Facebook comment, anything about that situation. And because I'm not accustomed to being a victim, I spoke out about it. So it's not that it wasn't known. And I will say to you what I said to my table group in another discussion. Yes, it is you who have to stand in support of and speak out on behalf of those of us who are for one reason or the other marginalized or hurting. Nobody's going to listen to us because we do not have the power. You do. So I have to stand here and literally beg for your support. I'm going to be a politician here. 
and ask for your support in not just forgiving yourselves and offering an apology to those of us, but intentionally making that space. So we are all, we've already pushed aside the proposal that would have made this a reality with the intercultural um, intentionality at various levels of the church. And I'm going to be stirring up a little bit of something here. When I say just look at the ministerial component in the places of the church, the geographical areas of the church where they are most culturally diverse. Who are the ministers in Toronto? Not us. But what is the population demographic of Toronto? Who are the ministers in Nova Scotia? Where there is a historical black, strong black community. There's, I don't know the whole history of Canada. You all know it, right? Yeah, good. So you know what the historical community is there, but what's the composition of the ministry there? And that speaks to, for me, I might be wrong and I'm wrong a lot of times, but it speaks to, for me, what happens intrinsically in our system. So while we have a wonderful proposal up there, and I thank you, Daniel, for raising that, I challenge us to go as far as the proposal says, not just in our business model, but in our work as church, with one another here, with our human beings who we meet on a daily basis, and with our work at the various councils, when it really matters, what will you do with those who are just a little bit different from you? Thank you, Minister.